The story of a dragon trying to find his place in the world. That's how I'd describe Breath of Fire 3. Well, actually, if I were going to describe Breath of Fire 3, I'd describe it as fucking fantastic. But the other thing I said sounds like way more sophisticated, so we're going to go with that. Yeah. I played this gem for the first time with a friend when I was a kid. It was the only game we played for about a year and a half. We'd spend hours up late at night, getting lost in the world, fighting monsters and trying to find where to go next. Watching Ryu turn into his Kaiser form for the first time is something that has always stuck with me as an unforgettable gaming experience. I adore Breath of Fire 3. So sit back, place your hand firmly down your pants, and let me tell you why I love this game. Our introduction is gorgeous. We're treated to a slow pan of a mural depicting an intense battle. And oh, look, 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 there's a Super Saiyan. This is actually a depiction of the Breath of Fire 1 story, which Breath of Fire 3 is a direct sequel to. It just takes place a few hundred years later. As the gentle music reaches its crescendo, we're greeted with the logo for Breath of Fire 3. Our game begins with a bang, as some miners blop a chunk of chrism that is encasing a small dragon. That small dragon is us, or Ryu as he's referred to in game, unless you call him something stupid. In this playthrough I called him Rog. Mogu and Gaza attack us and initiate a battle, leaving us with no choice but to attack them, killing them instantly. And then we try and make our way out of the mines. I just love the way the game sets this up. There are people mining, doing their job, and then bang, we're a dragon. We're setting shit on fire. This guy runs into a wall and this other guy's pissed his pants. Then we're knocked out with a crane and trapped in a cage. I must have left this train scene going for about 10 minutes as a kid, thinking the game was still loading. Then I randomly pressed a button and realized, hang on, I just moved. And then the game properly begins. We're introduced to best boy Ray, who discovers us and to our surprise, we're no longer a dragon. Instead, we're a naked bum bum baby. Ray realizes we're an orphan, but remains completely oblivious to the cage five feet away, and begrudgingly decides to take us back to his house, proving immediately that he's the best boy. When Ray isn't on screen, people should always be asking, where's Ray? <laughs> this is Tipo, another orphan that lives with Ray, and he's a little badass. Originally, I thought Tipo was a girl because he has long purple hair, and I hadn't seen a guy with that actual haircut until I discovered Tumblr. We're then told that Ray and Tipo are thieves, and they leave Ryu to sleep while they go to town to pinch some food. Breath of Fire 3 is so smooth with the way it sets the scene. 15 minutes into the game and we know that we're a boy that can turn into a dragon and we're teamed up with a pair of thieves with hearts of gold, who I affectionately refer to as the Ray team. Over the course of the next few hours, it becomes clear that the townspeople do not like Ray and Tipo, thinking of them as filthy street rats who don't work for a living like everyone else does. Our motley crew decides eventually to rob Bunyan, a big dude who was built like a brick shithouse. Surprisingly, robbing a man who was part tree trunk is a terrible idea because they get their heads caved in. Bunyan tells them that if they want to eat, they'll have to work, and he sends Ray off alone to kill a monster that has been terrorizing the village. Eventually, Tipo and Ryu catch up to Ray, and they defeat the monster, revealing that it was actually a mother trying to protect her own cubs. And this one looks like a clown. After calling Bunyan out on this, he leaves us with the question, if you had known she had cubs, would you have let her live? After killing the new, the townspeople absolutely adore the Ray team. High on the townspeople's love, they decide to rob McNeil, the greedy mayor who has been overtaxing his citizens and redistribute the money among the townsfolk in a Raven Hood situation. <laughs> This doesn't work out so well because the townspeople know that McNeil is tied to some shady characters and the money they stole was actually shady money. Even worse, the shady fellows know who shadily stole their shady money. SHADY! The Ray team find out about this through Bunyan, who just so happened to push a cow into this secluded hut for... reasons... unknown. <clears throat> so Ray, Tipo, and Ryu decide to skip town. Just gotta swing by the house first to grab some... Those, uh, actions they there did had consequences. Why am I doing that accent? This is where we meet Balio and Sunder, two buff unicorn horsemen who aren't very happy the Ray team stole their money. The resulting battle is incredibly one-sided, to the point where Ryu wakes up alone, being told by Bunyan that he was the only one there. From this point of the game, we have our motivation now. We want to find Tipo and Ray, especially Ray, because if we survived, then they surely did, right? And we, the player, also want revenge on those equine assholes because they split up the Ray team. This moment is also a huge turning point in the character development for Ryu. It was here I noticed his idle sprite has changed. Earlier he would stand around nervously and suck on his thumb, but after this point he just chomps on an apple. <laughs> Look at him go to town on it. Ryu heads to Windia in the hopes of finding Tipo and Ray, who have always said they were going to head over there once they've made a name for themselves as big time thieves. And that's as good a lead as any. Unfortunately, he bumps into Balio on Sunder, who just shanked the poor kid. Instead of dying like every good boy dreams of, he turns into a dragon because that's a thing that happens. 
The horsies figure that if they can take the dragon to the king, then they can make money off of it. Somehow. So of course we find ourselves locked up in the castle dungeon. The princess, who we find out is named Nina, lets the bad guys free because... She's a child. To absolutely no one's surprise, Ballet on Sunday kidnapped the princess. This is where I feel the next major part of Ryu's character evolution takes place. In the ensuing battle, Ryu attacks far more confidently here than he did before. He's taking aggressive, precise swings, compared to the scared flailing he was doing earlier. I feel like it's here that Ryu has decided to step up, not wanting to risk letting these guys hurt someone else like they did to him and the Ray team. It's at this point, Ryu goes from a follower to a leader. And if you don't think that's the tightest shit ever, then get out of my face. Get out of it, I'm over here now. I'm on the other side of the room. That's how much, I, I that's how tight I think it is. It's the tightest shit ever. We encounter Balio and Sunder several times after that point. Each time we do, they prove themselves to be bigger and bigger assholes, to the point where they capture one of your party members and force you to enter a fighting tournament so they can make money hand over... Hoof. Hoof. Our last encounter with Balio and Sunder is intense. We try to cross a bridge and they're waiting for us on the other side, pissed off that we managed to get away from the tournament with a whole army of 90s mobsters. With help from the tournament's winner, Gar, we take on Balio and Sunder in a final battle, which sees them fusing to become one Ultra Horse. Unlike previous bosses, it feels like everything in the game so far has been leading up to this battle. Ryu lost a family, but gained a new one, and with their help, he is able to defeat the enemy that broke up the Ray team. Actually, I lost the first time I fought him, but that's neither here nor there. Let's jump ahead much later in the game. We're now an adult. Spoilers! And we hear about a monster attacking travelers on Ogre Road, which leads to a local town called Sin City, a hub of criminal activity. There's even a prostitute here. Hello. No idea why it's called Sin City though. Of course we travel down Ogre Road and get harassed by an incredibly ripped tiger. My god, his shoulders are bigger than his biceps. He could just lift me up and toss me around. <clears throat> I mean, we quickly battle this monster before it runs away, which is a bit disappointing. We probably could have beaten this cat if we had a big enough plastic bag and some running water nearby. After talking to the innkeeper, we get a lead on where the tiger went. Ryu's old house. We get closer and Ryu asks Gar to wait behind. As we get nearer, we can hear the tiger's roars. Slowly, the camera pans to reveal... Ray! Yeah, our boy! He's alive! Hashtag gay for Ray! He tells us that he's basically been consumed with revenge since the night of the fire. He knows that Balio and Sunder are linked to Sin City, so he's been stalking the city for years, attacking the residents, hoping to get a lead on the supposed murderers of Tipo and Ryu. He then does a sick ninja jump and leaves Ryu alone at his former home. When we later show up to Sin City to do a little... sinning, we find out that it's been absolutely massacred. What caused the killer to do this? It must have been those pesky video games. We're told that it was a tiger and that he was after the boss of the crime syndicate, the guy Balio and Sunder were working for. We give chase and find Ray about to murder Mikba, the boss. However, our appearance distracts Ray and he starts talking about what it was like when he was young and how afraid he was of his own strength and BAM! Mikba turns into a demon and takes out Ray once and for all. Just kidding, we heal him up and he's good to go! After an intense battle, Mikba succumbs to his smoker's lung and disappears. Ray realizes that what he was doing was pointless. His quest for revenge wouldn't have brought Tipo and Ryu back and the people who split up the Ray team were defeated long ago. He then agrees to join the party on their quest to find out more about Ryu's dragon powers and the Ray team is reunited with a Ray that can transform into a were tiger. Ultimate badass. Whenever I think back to Breath of Fire 3, this is the arc that really stands out to me. Being pursued by Balio and Sunder and finally growing strong enough to take them out and finding out Ray is still alive, man, it's fantastic. It really talks to the growth of the characters. After losing his family, Ryu goes on a quest to find them, creates a new family, and tries to avoid Balio and Sunder, because although I, the player, am craving revenge, Ryu doesn't seem to want that. He's more insistent on protecting Nina, Momo, and Peko, and getting away from the criminals, because he doesn't want it to happen again. Meanwhile, from that point, Ray actively seeks revenge, and it twists him. He becomes a darker version of himself, single-minded in his goal, which is interesting, because before the split, Ray and Ryu would have had a very similar set of morals, with Ray acting as a sort of moral compass to Ryu. The Ray we see attacking Sin City is not a Ray who would have picked up a naked baby in the forest. So him reforming the Ray team with Ryu is the beginning of a path of redemption in my eyes. To be honest, I've barely scratched the surface of this game. If you want to know more, you should definitely check out this game for yourself. It's on the PSN store for about $10 as far as I know. 
Maybe if enough people buy Breath of Fire games, we can get a proper sequel and not a terrible mobile microtransactions game. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm the Dreamwell and I'm hashtag Gayforay. Sweet dreams.